Okay. Oh, you can lay down. Settle down then. Uh, right. Uh, this may be a longer session than normal, or it may be a shorter session than normal. Yeah, settle down. Okay. Come on. Um, what, what I've been doing for a while is starting uh, to prepare a course, or a series of courses, on, uh, for want of a better description, DevOps, but it's really the kind of mishmash of technologies that I've used throughout my career. Uh, now, it occurred to me quite some time ago that training courses and training material uh, tends to show um, idealized cases or cases where it's it's easy for the tutor to control and that's fair enough because you know you're trying to communicate a very specific concept or a specific idea uh, and that works well however it can be a bit disheartening um, to people trying to learn uh, particularly uh, more involved technology when they look at training material or written material uh, even even blog posts frankly tend to be very sanitized and cleaned up uh, and give the impression that everything is very straightforward of course one only needs to visit the um, uh, help for and and IRC and, and the various places that people go to get help mailing lists and so on uh, to realize that yeah life's not that straightforward uh, and there are very very many cases where uh, the uh, noob um, uh, you know the new user or someone who's even a seasoned veteran who's new to a particular technology can get themselves lost uh, and need uh, some assistance um, or indeed even where people with considerable experience can get lost and even people who've been doing this for many years uh, you know grey beards such as myself um, I, I, I with monotonous regularity uh, refer to material uh, uh, you know I, I, I often search for even the most trivial of things um, because I don't do them regularly uh, you know, I, I have to look them up occasionally um, and I, I often refer to the man pages um, uh, of, of things online uh, on my system um, even very simple things just to check which flag uh, does what so I, I guess what I'm saying is that quite often you know that something is possible or should be possible uh, because you've got a background in the kind of thing that happens the kind of thing that you know you, you would expect of a particular technology uh, but you don't know the specifics you don't know the, the precise details um, so you you look them up uh, uh, and I think that even the best of us and the people who uh, are viewed as being, you know, almost godlike, um, uh, are, are subject to this kind of uh, thing. Just excuse me for one second. Sorry about that. Uh, Kenny thought there was somebody at the door, didn't you, mate? Um, yeah, where was I? Yes, so uh, the idea behind these extended stream sessions uh, is to 
just show uh, in part to show my process and the kind of things that I end up doing but also so that people looking at the finished product uh, can see that in the making of that product I screwed up <laughs> uh, you know I made a mess of it many times um, and you know things don't go smoothly and you do end up having to fix things and you know we go back and we correct things so the way this material is going to be structured is we're going to be developing a, a, a proper system albeit you know we're not talking about scale systems like google and things like that we're talking about your regular everyday system the idea being that in miniature uh, we will look at all of the underlying technologies that you might encounter with a view to say, showing you how that they, they can all fit together. Uh, and also so that we can look at things like uh, how problems occur, uh, how we diagnose those problems, how we how, how you approach problem solving. Um, and indeed, you know, the fact that maybe uh, you know you choose the wrong technology when you first implement it and you have to change it uh, which brings me on to the subject of things like uh, the fact that when you're picking technologies often you need to look at first how do I get out of this situation uh, before we pick the technology that we're going to get into uh, I've worked on many projects where the wrong technology was chosen at the very start of the project uh, and they've dug such a deep hole for themselves and they haven't decoupled the system properly that you end up in this kind of like um, uh, investment hole. Uh, so you end up sticking with a bad technology simply because you haven't figured out ahead of time how you're going to get out of that technology in the long run. Now sometimes that's because we had no choice you know there was a technology that had to be used but quite often uh, with monotonous regularity um, it was because when the project was started um, people were so excited about a particular technology uh, that they didn't think ahead they didn't they didn't consider well yeah, what if this doesn't work? What if this doesn't work out? Um, and it, it, even before that, uh, you know, people don't bother looking at how their system is going to be deployed and maintained quite often. So they'll get very excited and develop an entire system. And sometimes we're talking about, you know, multi-million pound systems that have been developed. Uh, and I'm, I, I won't mention any names, uh, but th these are big, you know, you're talking about 80, 100 million pound systems. Uh, the people have developed um, and they've not really thought about how they're going to be deployed so when it comes time to deploy and this is often under a crunch you know when the project is running out of time um, there's a big panic about oh it takes you know a day and a half to deploy it or three days to deploy it and, and everybody starts saying well why, why can't we deploy this system quickly why can't we deploy it more efficiently and the answer is because well when you designed the system you didn't think about how it was going to be deployed uh, so <laughs> uh, with all that in mind um, you know we'll, we'll look at uh, uh, quite a lot about the way we deploy the system the way it's going to be updated and maintained uh, and the way we can automate some of that now of course uh, you, you will undoubtedly have encountered DevOps as a label um, like so many things it's it's a good idea that has become so polluted by marketing and hype uh, that it really it, it's almost meaningless nowadays um, uh, it, it's rather like Agile. Uh, a, a, Agile started out as a relatively concise, albeit problematic, um, idea. Um, and then, of course, the marketing people got hold of it and everything became Agile. Uh, and consequently, when you talk to people, everyone has their own idea about what Agile is and what it should be and what it means. Um, and as a consequence, it really doesn't mean anything very much at all to most people. Uh, and, and DevOps has, has unfortunately been, been tarred with that brush. De DevOps is 
one of those terms that everyone uses uh, and no one is really very clear on what it means uh, and when you go back to the original source and you see what it means it's kind of like oh, okay yeah that kind of makes sense so for us it's it's really it's going to mean what it has come to mean in the common parts and that is all of the technology uh, from cradle to grave uh, of looking after a system um, and uh, so that's what this series of streams is really going to be uh, and we will we'll we be building a real albeit relatively small uh, system so what is this system going to be well it's it's going to be everything related to the creation of these training courses <laughs> uh, and the delivery of them so uh, we'll be putting together a, a website and looking how uh, web technology works um, from very simple stuff through to much more complicated stuff so we'll start out with basic html and we'll do some templating and we'll do some code generation uh, and then we'll look at the more complicated side of it with adding on things like React components or, or you know, technology along those lines. We'll look at CMSs and why they may or may not be appropriate uh, and the fact that people tend to over apply them and why that's not a good thing in the long run. Um, we'll look at uh, virtual machines, uh, we'll look at the delivery of continuous integration and continuous development, we'll look at uh, building components and building components from scratch. Uh, building them from source, you know. Um, we'll look at how uh, development environments can be set up, uh, the way developers work uh, in in various fields. Uh, we'll look at networking. We'll look at security. Uh, we'll, we'll look at all of the cloud elements, and we'll look at uh, AWS and cloud computing in general. Um, uh, we'll use uh, a lot of DigitalOcean stuff because it's easy for us to manage the costs on. Um, and for all of its popularity, uh, the larger products like Azure and uh, Google Cloud Computing and um, AWS, they, they can be tricky because of the various licensing and technologies and costing, um, particularly with moving your data around. Um, and you can be taken uh, by surprise, and it can be quite a horrible surprise when the bill comes in. So, again, we'll look at those kind of issues as well, the management issues, the business decision issues, cost-benefit analysis. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm just trying to stop you from stepping on the keyboard, to be honest. Um, uh, so there's that. Now, I've been going along and, and sort of outlining some of these uh, the, the course elements already uh, and I've started creating some documentation uh, Kenny you really are going to pick me off if you keep this up um, so I've started creating some, some documentation Look, I, you're making me very nervous Just settle down uh, so we'll start out um, and you can see uh, you're really beginning to shove me off dog hey settle down come on come on settle down It's no good looking all sad like that. <laughs> if you step on my keyboard, I'm going to be very mad because you'll break something, I'm sure. Um, so we'll start out uh, looking at some really basic stuff. Uh, we're going to be using uh, three, maybe four, what I'll call surface tools. That is tools which will need to be installed on your host computer. Uh, whatever that is, whether it's Windows, Linux, Mac OS, open bsd whatever whatever you're using um uh you'll need at least three tools uh, and maybe four as we go on uh, and, and discuss some of the uh development environment features for example uh so you're going to need uh, git uh, which is a, a pretty standard version control tool you're going to need virtual box because uh, we're going to be creating all of our virtual machines in virtual box for now uh, we'll, we'll probably look at VMware and stuff later, but VirtualBox will do for now. Um, you're going to need um, uh, uh, Vagrant, because uh, we're going to be doing a lot of work with Vagrant, uh, at least initially, to create the 
uh, virtual machines. And you will need maybe a uh, packer. Yeah. So we'll, we'll do a very quick survey of those tools. Um, and then we'll start looking more in depth. So you can see here that uh, one, two, and three uh, are really, uh, these documents are related to creating virtual machines. So in one and two, we'll look at the um, graphical user interface and the command line interface to VirtualBox and how those are, can be used to create virtual machines. Uh, then we'll look at how Vagrant makes that somewhat easier. Um, uh, now I've got a note in here about uh, discussing testing because initially uh, we we're going to use things like PyTest um, and uh, test infra uh, for testing our infrastructure, that is our virtual machine installations and ultimately our operational in, 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 uh, machines. Uh, then we'll look at using SALT to provision a Vagrant Debian machine. Uh, and SALT will be the tool of choice for us uh, initially for managing our uh, infrastructure. Uh, why SALT? Why not something like Puppet or um, uh, Ansible uh, is a very popular configuration management tool uh, uh, or Chef. Um, the answer to that is uh, twofold. Um, first of all, Salt is based on Python, and Python is pretty much a standard install on, on Debian boxes. Um, and we're going to be using a lot of uh, Linux, uh, particularly Debian based machines. Uh, but that's not the only reason. The, the other reason is that Salt is, a, is somewhat more than just a configuration management tool. It, it was designed from the ground up to be an infrastructure management tool. So it really uh, is much more than just a configuration management tool uh, and, and was designed that way from the start. Um, and for that reason, we'll, we'll use SALT. Uh, initially, we're basically using it for configuration management, uh, but we'll also show how it can be used for a certain degree of testing and why that may or may not be a good idea. Um, we'll show how it can be used for system monitoring, uh, uh, automating uh, system repair, that kind of issue. So yeah, so we'll use SALT. Um, then uh, we're going to be looking at things like uh, bash scripting, because we're going to be using quite a lot of that, um, and how to do static code analysis, that kind of thing. Uh, we'll obviously look at Git. Um, and we'll take quite a detailed look at getting on one branch. We'll meander off and we'll do a lot of that. Uh, then you can see there's a whole section or series of sections there for Markdown, LaTeX, Pandoc. Um, those are all for the documentation system of which these documents are a part. Uh, and I'll discuss how um, I'm looking to develop something to help uh, auto-generate websites and documentation that accompanies the courses, how the web courses will automate a lot of those into a CI CD pipeline, how they're going to be developed and delivered. Um, uh, then we, we're back again to the server and we'll look at firewalls, networking, uh, DHCP, the ARC table. Uh, these are all just subjects that came up as I was developing these scripts. And this is pretty much the way the course is going to go. Uh, as we encounter a technology, it will go into a backlog. Sometimes we'll dive down that particular rabbit hole. Other times we will put it to one side and we'll come back to it. So sometimes I'll just sort of brush over it and we'll treat it superficially. Uh, you know, say, well, okay, we'll just do this for the time being and we'll come back to it. Other times we'll, we'll disappear off down that particular rabbit hole. Um, then there's a whole series of, of material on uh, handling metadata in inside these documents um, and how that will go to a series of um, programs and applications and scripts uh, for uh, managing the production of these documents. Um, then uh, We've got things like uh, 
uh, some stuff on Python. Again, we won't go into a huge amount of detail on individual programming language, but sometimes we'll, we'll take a bit of a paddle. Um, then we'll look at setting up a developer virtual machine uh, so that we're all using the same basic system, um, which is obviously good from the point of view of our courses. Uh, uh, we'll look at um, Python testing, uh, discuss some of the principles of code development. Anyway, I'm not going to go through all of this. You, you, you can read. Uh, and, and these are the, these are only the sort of outlines of, of what's going to go on. Uh, and in fact, we, we will go on and discuss quite a lot. Um, and we'll jump around backwards and forwards in these. So although they're listed in this order, this isn't the order of the material. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be jumping backwards and forwards anyway. Okay, uh, so that's a long rambling introduction to why these streams exist. Uh, so where will you find the material in the long run? Well, um, quite a lot of it will go up on YouTube. Uh, so uh, these streams are all mirrored from Twitch and uh, are available on YouTube under Salty Vagrant Streams. Uh, but under the main Salty Vagrant account, we'll do the more polished and edited you know, courses, so the, the, the lectures, if you will, um, which will be a lot tighter and a lot more focused than these sort of rambling streams. Um, so all, all of the mistakes will be cut out of those, uh, and, uh, and you'll just get the raw material. Um, ultimately, uh, we'll have a website, and on that website there will be um, access to uh, subscriber-based material. So you'll be able to subscribe, which helps me to do these, uh, this course or these courses. Um, but rather than sell them individually or through one of the known platforms, and we'll, we'll get into all of the, the what, where's and why force of that, uh, what I intend to do is have a limited access subscriber model, uh, which will be relatively cheap. It'll be kind of like, I don't know, four or five pounds a month or something like that. Um, and... The idea behind it is uh, to limit it to uh, a, a, a few hundred or a few thousand people. Uh, I haven't decided exactly how it's going to work yet. Um, <clears throat> but I want to try and keep it relatively small uh, so that you can get direct access to me uh, and I can help out if you are struggling with the material. Um, but at the same time, uh, keep it relatively uh, exclusive. Uh, so I don't, I really don't want it to get massive. Um, and, and again, I'll, I'll go into the reasons as and when we, we're, we're discussing that. So, uh, right, okay, enough rambling bollocks. Let's... Uh, it's going to be one of those days, isn't it, Kenny? Mm -hmm. Yes. So enough of this. Let's let's start out where we need to start. So um, let's talk about uh, VirtualBox on the graphical user interface. Now, uh, to, to do that, uh, unfortunately, all of my OBS is actually focused on... Hmm. That's an interesting question. How am I going to do this? Okay, let's put you to one side. Uh, just bear with me a second. I'm going to create another OBS scene. Uh, so that uh, I can... Right, let's add... Uh, hmm. Okay, let's see if I can show you just my desktop, maybe. Uh, and we don't want the main desktop, we want 
That's it, test top one. There we go. Right, so we want test top one. And shrink that down so that it actually fits. Unfortunately, that might mean it's too small for you to see, but we'll, we'll see how we go on. Okay, and then add. Uh, come on. Audio capture, browser, blah, 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 blah. Come on, Mark. Uh, audio capture, here we go. And we just want the existing mic. Okay, that'll do for now. Okay, uh, that'll do. It's a, it's a bit temporary because we do very little stuff on the desktop. Um, right, uh, let's, uh, let's just... Uh, dun, 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 come on. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And... Oops, I mean to do that. Bear with me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now you can see my glorious visage. Okay, um, now I realise that this is probably going to be very, very tiny, um, but it, it will do for now. Uh, so what we are looking at uh, is uh, I'm going to uh, start up uh, virtual box. Now then, uh, that said, there we go. Okay, so this is uh, the, the uh, OBS going mental because I'm switching between stuff. Okay, so this is the uh, the, the standard uh, VirtualBox Manager screen uh, on on a Mac. It'll be very similar on Windows and stuff. Um, and uh, creating a virtual machine is actually fairly straightforward. Uh, so let's just go new uh, and then. We'll call it um, demo one. Uh, where we're going to put it, um, and I'll just put it in my standard virtual boxes directory. Uh, we will create a Linux machine, and we'll paste it on Devon 64-bit. Uh, give ourselves a bit more RAM, uh, eight gig. Now, obviously, if you're working on a laptop, you probably want to keep this to two to four gig uh, on, a, on a simple demo box. Um, uh, I'm working on a, a quite beefy machine uh, on my Mac Pro, um, so uh, there's no shortage of memory. Uh, we've got what? Um, about half of it used. Um, so yes, we want to create a virtual disk. Uh, we will create a virtual disk. Uh, we'll give it a bit more than eight gig, I think. Uh, twenty. Uh, I find twenty gig is reasonable for most virtual machines, unless you've got a particular purpose in mind. Uh, okay, so that has just created uh, the bare bones uh, virtual machine. We've not yet installed a system on it, but if we boot that machine. <clears throat> Uh, oh, hello. Right. So uh, so this is now saying uh okay uh what um what do you want to put on it? Uh now I'm gonna just install Debian ten Okay. Uh, now this is uh, an ISO that I've already used, but if if you if you needed to get to it, you can see here it's in my downloads folder. 
Um, if you needed to uh, uh, actually get to it, uh, then uh, you would choose a virtual disk file by going to the browser and actually picking one. Okay, uh, so I've already got one, uh, so let's start that. And now it's exactly the same as if you're installing it anywhere else. Okay, we're going to do a graphical install. So, yes. Uh, I'm going to go with English, uh, United Kingdom, uh, British English. FYI, uh, th th these, uh, uh, th th okay, let's just have a quick look. Uh, VirtualBox is available from virtualbox.org. Okay, so just go to virtualbox.org and download whichever version is appropriate to you. So that's straightforward enough. Uh, and that will, once you've installed it, that will get you to the Oracle VirtualBox install. Oh, we're back over here now. Uh, so, uh, it, Give it the, a host name now. Um, Debian is the default, uh, but we'll call it demo one. Uh, if I wanted to, uh, uh, it says here it's a single word that identifies your host on the network. Yeah, it's kind of true. Uh, it's good to identify on the local network on a single sub node uh, on a single subnet, but yeah. Oh, no, demo. Okay, fine. Demo one. And, and now we've got to uh, put the rest of um, the uh, full domain name in. Okay. So it would be like demo one on my system. Uh, and then what the, the particular network I'm on is LAN1 allstopme.uk. Okay. Uh, right, give it a root password, which is not very secure. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Full name of the user, fine. Again, you don't really need to put real things in here. Uh, Now, we could go off on a great big long explanation of what all of these mean, but broadly speaking, if you're just building a virtual machine for fucking around with, then use the entire disk guided is fine. Okay. Um, if you want to play with logical volume management, then obviously you'll want to choose that one or that one. Um, uh, this setup. Uh, requires that if you want an encrypted disk then it requires that you put LVM on, LVM on as well. Now it's not strictly necessary, you don't need LVM uh, in order to create encrypted disk systems um, but that's just the options that they offer. Okay so what is logical volume management? Um, without going into a huge amount of detail uh, you may or may not be aware that when you uh, add a disk to uh, a system, that disk has got a unique ID. Uh, and by default, those disks tend to be mounted as separate entities within the file system. Now, they can be made to look like a part of the main file system, uh, particularly on, on Linux systems. Um, uh, it, less simple on Windows systems, but on, on a Linux system, they can all look like the 
uh, a part of the main file system. But they're actually separate things. So when you look under, um, uh, when you when you go to manage your disk space, you will find that let's say you put two uh, ridiculously small five gigabyte drives in. Okay, um, each of those five when you'd filled up the five gigabytes of that particular part of the network uh, file system, that's it. Uh, you, you can't go bigger than that. You can break them up into smaller partitions, but you can't go bigger than that 5 gig. Okay, so what you'd find is that if you had a, a an insane system where you've got one directory that contained all of it, actually a good example would be um, if you mounted, say, your home directory. Okay, and I realize that this might be gobbledygook to some of you, but it, we'll, we'll get there, trust me. But if you mounted the home directory onto a 5 gigabyte drive, the most you could ever fit into your home directory would be that 5 gigabytes. Okay, uh, and if you then wanted to add a second 5 gigabyte drive, um, you would find it would be difficult because you'd have to then subdivide the home and remap it and go, ah, oh, be a right dog's dinner. With LVM, that problem kind of goes away um, because what you can do is you can say no it's this logical volume that is mounted as home and i can add as many drives as i like into there uh, and as far as the operating system is concerned it's just seen as one big contiguous lump of disk space so if i added a second five gigabyte drive and mapped it into the same logical volume okay then i would end up with 10 gigabytes in my home directory um so Logical volume management in this context makes it much simpler to add on uh, new uh, drive space you know, without having to go around resizing file systems or shunting them across to different drives or anything like that. You just add the new drive into the logical volume and it just appears like magic. Okay. Now, there will be people out there now screaming at the screen saying, well, why don't you just use BRFS or ZFS for your file system and be done with it? Because these are kind of built in features. And the answer is, sure, why not? Um, it just happens that the installer here doesn't offer that. So that's the long story. The short story is just use the entire disk. OK, we'll just have a very simple disk system. We don't need anything complicated for this particular application. Okay, so we're going to use the whole of this disk. Uh, and we're going to put all of the all the files in one partition. Okay. Now, <clears throat> okay, while we're on the subject of partitions, why, uh, and, and this is a common enough question, why would you separate out your home partition from the rest of your file system? Or why would you separate out our home bar and temp in two separate partitions? Well, the answer is... Under normal circumstances, if I uh, was rebuilding my operating system, for example, for whatever reason, um, the home partition particularly, which is where all of the users own files and most of the data on your system, if, if it's primarily a single user system, uh, would live. I would live under the home directory, okay? So what I could do is I could say, well, okay, well, I have this nice big partition for my home directory, and when I rebuild my system, I can completely throw away and junk anything which isn't the home partition, recreate that partition from scratch and re reinstall Debian or whatever, and then just mount the home partition back into my operating system, and all my data will still be there. If I put it all on one partition, I can't do that. Okay, because the, the data for home will be all mixed in with the rest of the file system on on that partition. There's no way of conveniently separating out. I'd end up having to <clears throat> back it up onto another drive and then install my automating, bring it all back again. Okay, so partitions can be useful for managing that kind of stuff. Um, they've got other uses as well, uh, and there are other reasons for creating some partitions. For example, you can have different file systems on different partitions. Um, if you wanted to experiment with that. Uh, another reason would be uh, uh, the aforementioned uh, logical volume management where you could have those partitions be spread out, uh, although you, it would be done slightly differently. Um, so, yeah, uh, but again, these are virtual machines that we don't need any complicated file system management for um, because 
we're just using them to throw away uh, and it's not the focus of our attention at the moment when we come to look at some specialized applications uh, we'll create virtual machines with specialized file systems that we can then show how those work uh, so okay so this is now showing us uh, what we're going to get okay so you can see here we're going to get one primary partition which is uh, x4 format uh, and we're going to get one logical partition uh, which is the swap okay so we, we actually ended up with two partitions even though it said install everything in one partition and that is because this swap space is farmed out to a, a, a separate partition uh, what is swap well um, if you're running a machine with a limited amount of RAM, particularly a limited amount of RAM, uh, then the swap space is used as a temporary sort of cache uh, of things that won't fit into memory at a given time. Um, you can run systems quite okay without swap space, uh, but for, uh, historically we, we've always assigned uh, swap and you can see that the swap space is around about the same size as the memory in this case <clears throat> do you need to do that hmm. there's a lot of debate about this uh, particularly when you're running um, ssds which are prone to problems if you're doing a lot of rapid small writes uh, now i've i've seen it said that you shouldn't create swap files if you're using ssds and you've got sufficient ram uh, because all they do is cause trouble mm. then again i've seen arguments that say well that's rubbish because if you've got plenty of ram your swap space is barely going to be used anyway um, which uh, is kind of true uh, things still get swapped out into swap even though you've got plenty of ram so uh, it's 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 true-ish. Um, you won't get as much load on your swap, that's for sure. Um, some virtual uh, cloud providers uh, disallow swap completely um, on the grounds that it does damage the SSDs. And that's probably true for a cloud provider, um, you know, where there's people are hammering away at these machines 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and the SSDs get a lot of, of, of uh, work, you know, um, a lot of writes uh, repeatedly so i can see that from that in that context i can see that it might be problematic uh, but for most home users and, and small systems this isn't really going to be an issue so anyway we'll leave it as is uh, so we'll continue uh, oops. Uh, so yes and continue. Um, <clears throat> you will have got the idea by now that I can be a bit digressive in these streams. Uh, most of the time, this is the way it's going to go. Uh, we'll end up with an awful lot of garbage talked uh, <clears throat> while while I'm waiting for things. But also, uh, we'll we'll have these little digressions that may or may not make sense depending on where you are in your journey. And that's okay. Um, you know, it's fine. I mean, there's an awful lot, of, uh, an awful lot of times that I will watch YouTube videos on a subject that I'm not familiar with, and uh, that's kind of the fun thing because uh, then I can go down that rabbit hole and try and figure out what it was all about. Uh, and it's it's okay. It's okay to not know. In fact, not knowing is actually more interesting in many ways than than knowing. Because if you know something, yeah, it's kind of cool to be able to do stuff. Uh, but the not knowing and figuring out, trying to solve the problem, uh, that's, for me, uh, that's always been where the fun is. And the point, the whole point about this stuff uh, and the, the mix of technologies that we're going to encounter is uh, that throughout my career, um, this is precisely what's happened. I've, I've learned most of the stuff I know on the job, and it's mostly been because there's been a pain point, there's been a problem, there's been something that hasn't been working the way it should or the way we want it to. Uh, and my principal role has been 
okay, figure it out. Uh, you know, how do we fix it? Uh, right, where are we? Uh, scan another CD. No, I don't want to do that. Right, so. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, whatever. Uh, nope, we don't need a proxy at the moment. One of the more interesting things that will come out of this, when we, when we start looking at diagnosing problems, uh, and, and uh, particularly when it comes to things like networks, um, when you're working on, on, a, on a real system uh, as against something that you're, you're um, using for teaching purposes, uh, things start to get complicated, especially in enterprise environments where you've got many people sort of involved in the process. Um, but there, there are ways of analyzing what's going on. There are ways of, of narrowing down very quickly where the problem is most likely to be. Uh, and once you've done that, uh, by knowing only a, a few things, um, you begin to get a feel for where to poke the system, where, where, to, where to prod it, uh, in order to provoke it to revealing uh, wh where the real problem is. Um, but <laughs> I mean, if you want to be, if I wanted to be really clear, I would say, if you're having a problem communicating between two machines, the most likely thing is check your firewall settings. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would bet mm, eighty-five percent of the time, yeah. uh, when I've had a problem with communication between two machines or two systems or two um, things working on different ends of a network, uh, the firewall has ended up being a, a, a if not the problem, certainly a contributor to the problem. Um, so yes, being aware of, of firewalls and how to diagnose those kind of problems is all part and parcel of what we're going to be looking at. Anyway, what was it? Uh, system man, obviously, uh, uh, no. Um, only, only because we're not going to have this machine around long enough for it to matter. Uh, right, now then, we do not want a desktop environment. Um, uh, we don't need no stinking goy around here. 99.99% .99 of what we're going to do, we are going to do without a graphical user interface. I, I'll, I'll rephrase that. Uh, most of the work we do setting up the system will be done without reference to a graphical user interface. Uh, we'll be using the command line for the vast majority of the work we do. The vast majority. And this is true... Uh, no matter what environment you're working in, even if you, even if you are unfortunate enough to work in a Windows environment, uh, you should be looking to work on the command line most of the time. <clears throat> why? Well, this illustrates why. Okay, we're using this graphical user interface. So ask yourself this question. How would you automate what we've just done? Uh, and the answer is, uh, really difficult. It's really difficult unless this tool, uh, this 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 interface, gives me a way of recording it and, and figuring out, you know, r running it back. Now there are ways of recording GUI interactions and playing them back, but in my experience, they are even the best of them are flaky at best. Um, <clears throat> so. The point being that it's very, very difficult to do this kind of graphical user interface interaction uh, and have it reliable and repeatable. Okay, but as we will see, as soon as you start doing things with a command line, you can start doing them programmatically. And as soon as you do things programmatically, they become repeatable. You can put them on paper, as it were. Oh, electronic file okay you can run them repeatedly you can debug them and once you debug them uh, they will work that way if you've done your job properly over and over and over again with 100 percent reliability now the downside to that is if you fuck it up then it will be fucked up every time you run it um but then that's the glory of debugging 
Okay, and I cannot tell you. Okay, I've, I've worked in environments, and, and I've got nothing fundamentally against Windows, but dear God, uh, you know, you work in these environments that are primarily graphical user interface driven. Uh, the problem is you end up with document after document and screenshots explaining, okay, now you set this up, now you set that up, now you set the other up. <clears throat> um, and the problem is that those documents then have to be followed by another engineer who is going to reproduce what you're doing. And, you know, he only has to miss out a step or misunderstand a step or, or you know, uh, type something in incorrectly. And uh you can end up with a very subtle difference in your environment okay that makes it virtually impossible uh, to figure out easily what the hell is going wrong as soon as you abandon the graphical user interface in what you're doing okay and you turn your attention to doing things programmatically uh, you uh, life becomes so much simpler okay because at least when things go tits up you've got something that you can debug and get it right and once it's right you can give it to a complete simpleton and all you say to them is copy this file and run it <laughs> or better yet run this file okay that's all you need to know um uh, and it's only when things go wrong you have to call in somebody with expertise okay so that means you can have just your, your bait here yeah, an operator with no knowledge of what's going on can just run your script and it will install your system uh, and that's the magic of the command line uh, i say magic it's not magic it's just common sense yeah uh, anyway uh, onward and upward where are we yes so we want the print server taken out we do definitely want the ssh server ssh is your friend uh, and we'll, we'll believe standard system utils in. Uh, and the other advantage of getting rid of the graphical user interface is, oh, blimey, do they take up space. Uh, they take up a lot of memory, they take a lot of CPU, take up disk space, uh, you know, and for our purposes, they're pointless. The only time we're going to use a graphical user interface is when we access stuff through uh, the web browser. Um, but we're not going to be administering our system through them. That's for the user experience, and that's great. The users, brilliant. Yeah? Graphical user interfaces are great if you're a user, okay? Because uh, uh, that's what they're good for, okay? They simplify the interface to the user uh, in most cases, and they make it look pretty. Um, the command line, on the other hand, simplifies it for the administrator. It makes it much easier for you to manage. Now, would I try to do, um, you know, uh, graphics manipulation or video editing uh, from the command line? Not so much. Uh, we'll, we'll see as we go on that, yeah, you can do a lot on the command line, particularly when it's standardized. Um, but would I do it as a matter of choice? Most of the time, no. Uh, if, there's a, if there's an easily automatable step, then yes, absolutely. Um, but would I try to do complex nonlinear non 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 complex nonlinear editing of video? No, that's what graphical interfaces are good for. Okay, but again, generally, you don't have to do those dozens of times or hundreds of times. They don't have to be repeatable. Uh, you know, that's a, it's a process that you do once and when you've done it, the end product is what's important, not how you got there. Um, when you're doing stuff on the command line and you're setting up complex systems, uh, yes, the end product is important and that's the point, but it's the process of how you got there which is more important from the point of view of being able to administer the system. Uh, right, where are we? Uh, uh, it seems this is a new installation, but it would be, wouldn't it? Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll use the grub loader, um, and we'll use SDA, which is the only drive we've got. And that's it. And so now, uh, it will boot the machine. Okay, so what we're looking at now is what you would see 
on the console the console being the special terminal okay uh, what do i mean by special terminal i mean it's the terminal which is physically connected to this particular server okay now obviously it's a virtual machine we don't have a physically connected um, monitor and a physically connected keyboard okay but that's what we're doing here we're looking at what you would see on a physically connected uh, monitoring keyboard uh, and this is the only way of getting to this particular login this, this is the console login this is the only way of getting it to it now if you're working in a big data center uh, on a physical machine uh, then you would generally the way you would get to this console is you would actually go physically and there would be a drawer in the rack and you would pull that drawer out and there would be a monitor on it and you would sit there and you would be able to connect to this um usually there's sort of an arrangement of um, kvm keyboard switching so you can switch to which server you want that keyboard to be connected to but basically yeah it's a physical thing in the rack um in some uh modern uh, uh data centers then these would be much as they are here they're remote things but again th there's a, a specific console connection quite often on separate networks and things like that uh yeah management networks um so the console is a special place but for our purposes it's going to be the way we log in for the first time okay so uh because because we you will so okay sometimes when you install a machine yeah the root account will be disabled and sometimes it will be available uh, now on these machines uh, we can actually log in as root uh, I'll show you later how to disable it uh, or we can log in as ourselves and these accounts generally speaking uh, oh, there we go okay we don't have sudo okay that, but we can do su okay so we can we can switch to be root uh, if we wanted sudo we would have to install it okay so we okay so that's creating a machine using the graphical user interface dull boring who cares um, and oops don't want to do that yes of course uh, okay right so that's that's setting it up the boring way and that's the last time uh, we will use the interface uh, now we want to get rid of it uh, uh, remove it uh, Oh, mm. ah, there we go. And delete all the files, yes, because we don't want it. Okay. Uh, so turning our attention back to the command line the command line is our friend okay and if we look at um, document number two okay this is creating it uh, the right way uh, so let's uh, split our screen and uh, all right now got all sorts of directories here that i'm doing jobs in um uh, the classroom is ultimately where we're going to work uh, but for this purposes we will just uh go into the streams directory okay that's uh pi builder and a load of existing stream files so let's create a new directory called uh, well, let's just call it demo uh, okay in fact i think that's what yeah that's what i call it over here so we've got make directory and demo okay so uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to define an alias uh, vbm 
which will be an alias for vbox manage. Okay, now vbox manage is the command line interface to VirtualBox. It'll be installed when you install VirtualBox. Uh, a very, very short aside, okay, if you're not familiar with it, alias just means that now, whenever I type BBM, it will be interpreted as VBox Manage, okay? Uh, it's, a, it's a special form of command substitution on the command line, uh, 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 on, on the Linux system anyway. Okay, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to export uh, a variable called VM, okay, which we will call VB demo. Okay, so now that variable has got the value VB demo. Cool. Uh, right, now I'm just going to follow the script on the left hand side. Uh, I've done this more formally in, in the training course, but uh, for now, let's just follow this script. In fact, I can probably just copy and paste these commands. There's no point retyping them, is there? Uh, okay. Okay, so what's this one doing? Okay, this is creating the bare bones virtual machine. Okay, which is if you like, uh, it's the it's the sort of the main object within VirtualBox, uh, which will pull everything together. Okay, so this is just a virtual machine. Uh, we're using the the dollar VM. Okay, which is our uh, virtual machine name we've just defined. If you remember VB demo, uh, the the register will just uh, register it with that library interface that we saw, and I'm setting the base folder manually to be the current directory. And the reason for that is if you don't do that, it will create it in our default location, which is that VM folder. Uh, so uh, all, all that base folder is doing is saying, no, 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 I want to use this demo folder as our base. Mm -hmm. So there we go. Okay, so now you can see we've now got this folder, VB demo, uh, which has been created. Okay, and we've got uh, within that, there's the VBox itself, uh, which is the virtual box definition file. Yeah. Okay, so we need some disk space to actually install uh, our system onto, so that's what this command is going to do. Okay, so we're going to create a hard disk, uh, HD. Uh, we're going to create it, we could create it anywhere we like, but I'm going to, for, to keep it tidy, I'm going to create it under that VB demo directory that was just created as part of creating the virtual box. Um, and I'm going to create it as... Uh, 20,000 K effectively. Okay, it's a 20 gigabyte drive. Okay, so that's that. And like any uh, hard drive, it's got its own unique, universally unique identifier, UUID. Okay, uh, so the next thing we want to do uh, is create a controller. Okay, so this is something that will allow us to connect SATA drives, and SATA is just a, um, a communication standard uh, for uh, our, to connect our virtual machine to disk drives of various sorts. Okay, so that's what that does. Whoops. Uh, hello. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Looks like the interface has changed since I ran this. Cool. Uh, oh. Oh, that's a bit of a drag, isn't it? Okay. Well, okay. So, what's it called now? Or have I just named it incorrectly? Uh, Dun, dun, dun. So we can create a medium. Mm. Oh, here we go. Storage CTL. There it is in there. We 
Ja, wo war ich sie? Da auf da. Hm. Ah, genau, ne? Da bin ich erst. Ne, da bin ich Typo. Uh, we've got storage CTL. Okay, so what's that? So what this has done is create that SATA controller. Okay, might as well create that spelling mistake while I'm here. Uh, uh, oops. Alright. Oh. <laughs> Alright. Let's get rid of that. Uh, I'm gonna guess that I need to get rid of that as well. Right, so now, uh, so we've we've now created our virtual machine, and we've created a, a hard drive, uh, a virtual disk, okay, and we've added a controller to the hard drive. So now we're going to use that controller to connect the hard drive to the virtual machine, and that's what this storage attach does. Uh, and oops, making a right dog's breakfast of that. Uh, okay, helps if you're actually in the correct window. Okay, so this storage attached now. Again, we're using the VM, which is VB Demo. Okay, the storage controller is that SATA controller that we just created. Uh, we're going to create it on port zero device zero on the SATA controller. It's a hard disk drive and the medium is going to be that virtual drive that we just created. Okay. And it can't find uh, a thing called SATA controller. Why not? Uh, oh, because because of typos. Controller. There we go. Right, okay, so let's correct that while we're here. I want that to be called SATA controller. There you go. Okay, uh, so the next thing we want to do is we want to uh, create, connect the um, drive, uh, effectively the CD drive. Okay, so this time uh, and Right, so this time uh, remembering that we've we've got a typo. Okay, so this time we are connecting the VM <coughs> uh, and we're connecting it to the storage controller, SATA controller controller if you've misspelled it this time to port one whereas previously it was port zero uh, we changed the type okay so the type is now dvd drive rather than hdd and the medium this time instead of being a the virtual disk image is now this download folder iso okay which you'll recognize is the 10.0 that we created before all right, so we've now correct now connected those two together. Now we're going to do some housekeeping stuff, which is uh, give ourselves more memory again. Okay, uh, we're going to add a network interface, and we're going to. Tell the system that this is a Debian operating system. And now we're back to creating the machine as we did before. Okay. And quite reasonably, one could object. Oops. Uh, uh, and oh. 
Right. Uh, let's try that again, shall we? Oh, there we go. So, uh, sorry, my bad. Okay, so it's now running. Okay, so this is the uh, the, the VirtualBox demo. Okay, and it's running. You can see it's running in the virtual, and you can see here this is the console. And in actual fact, we can open the console. Uh, okay, and it's running. Now, you could reasonably object at this point and say, well, hang on a minute, we're no better off because we're back to a graphical user interface now because we're, we're, <coughs> we're interacting with it graphically. And the answer is absolutely. Uh, but it will surprise no one, I hope, that there is a better way of doing this. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole process again. But the point is, you can see that we've got this far um, uh, without the need to uh, interact with the graphical user interface. We've done it all through the command line. Um, and I'm going to close that. Uh, and will I continue running the browser? No, we're going to power the machine off and we're going to delete it. Uh, now, this is where uh, a, a system like Packer comes in. Okay because Packer will allow us to automate all of the steps, including you know, choosing how we set our machine up. Uh, okay. All I wanted to do is demonstrate that, yeah, we can, we can do everything we need to do from the command line, uh, at least as far as we're going to go here. Uh, now then, uh, let me... Uh, right, this is just about connecting a USB drive and so on. Okay, so that's kind of like the manual way of doing it. All right. Um, a better way of doing it, for our purposes anyway, is to use a system called Vagrant. Now, this again is something that you would need to install. Okay, and uh, if you go to the website Vagrant Up dot com okay uh, you will see just a simple download uh, and I'm just going to check my uh, vagrant version uh, 2G9 cool I'm actually up to date uh, no, sorry that that headless message is just a residual message from the uh, uh, Vbox headless running in the background uh, the one that we just got rid of. Right, okay. That's, uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, very good to do you can see I'm, I'm actually running the latest version, which is excellent. Right. But yeah, um, again, uh, as with VirtualBox, just download it, uh, follow the install instructions. It's not exactly rocket science. And what this allows us to do is this allows us to simplify considerably uh, creating virtual machines um, locally. Uh, we will look at at least two ways of, uh, well, three ways actually, of managing um, cloud machines. Uh, we're going to use, as our primary method, we'll end up using Salt Cloud, I suspect. Uh, but we'll also look at HashiCorp's Terraform, which is kind of cool. Uh, and they, they work in very similar ways. Uh, and I believe now that Vagrant can do it as well. Um, I've not played with it myself because there's no no point for what I want to do. Um, but I gather Vagrant can can create uh, at least for some of them cloud providing. But let's have a look now. Ah, oh, the beauties of streaming, where you can just go off on a weird here we go, boxes now. Um, Uh, provide that's what we need uh, okay so we can get VirtualBox VMware Docker uh, okay so we can create we can create Docker machines uh, so nah, maybe not hmm. 
It's okay. Well, it doesn't matter. Packer can. Mm. And, and like I said, they've got Terraform, which is a whole product in its own right. <coughs> uh, specifically for doing cloud. So, okay. Um, so let's... Uh, what are you doing? Uh, not paying attention to what you're doing. Uh, oh, actually, yes, I do want to write now because I made those spelling corrections. Okay, so um, those first two will be converted into uh, much neater, tidier um, walkthroughs on on um, YouTube. Uh, Uh, not quite sure why that's open. Okay. So, uh, that's the first two done. Uh, how are we going to have time? Mm, got a bit of time left. Okay, let's use let's use Vagrant to build the Debian server. Okay. So now, uh, this is this is the type, This is the way we're going to do it. Uh, more more commonly, okay. Um, now I've mentioned Packer already, okay. And Packer Packer is a way to automate via script uh, installing the base box and then installing any customization you want on it, okay. Uh, and I'm not going to go through Packer right now. But suffice to say uh, the packer can be used to create boxes for variant and a box uh, boxes for variant boxes for vagrant okay and a vagrant box is to all intents and purposes it is a virtual machine uh, in vitro if you like it, it's a virtual machine ready to be created and installed a template of a virtual machine let's put it that way okay uh, and uh, as it says over here uh, I favor these bento boxes uh, so bento uh, uh, which is uh, the, the crew that um, uh, quick um, maintain is the word I'm looking for the crew that maintains chef and they create a whole load of predefined boxes uh, that they evidently use for uh, testing. The good news is uh, they make them all freely available. Uh, and I found them to be uh, extremely reliable. So let's, uh, let's start out. Uh, we'll, we'll create uh, the basic bento box okay now we'll do it the the easy way okay let's uh let's just do vagrant edit okay and then we say which box we want our box to be based on okay in this case bento slash debian 10 okay uh, so we do that now this is just initializing the vagrant system Okay, so it's creating this vagrant file. It hasn't created the, the machine yet. Okay, so we've just got the vagrant file. Okay, now if we look at that vagrant file, you'll see it mainly comments. Okay, uh, there, there are only about four lines in it, I think, or three or four lines uh, that are not commented out. Having said that, great. Uh, it, it tells us everything we want to know okay but what I want to do is I want to cut that down okay so get rid of all of the comments now there are a number of ways of doing it uh, so let's have a look at a few of them shall we uh, let me just um, uh, we, we can we can look at the the merits of each of these in turn okay uh, so here's the first way Okay, so we cap the vagrant file, which just outputs it to standard out, and then we pipe that output into the standard input of a grep command, okay, which is just going to look for all of the comments 
so this is saying uh, match. Uh, okay, it's worth it's worth going through this, isn't it? Uh, minus e is the extended grep. Okay, so it's uh, more more like the the Perl grep uh, regular expressions. Don't know what a regular expression is. Okay, we'll come back to that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you'll just have to listen to this gobbledygook. Uh, minus V. Uh, okay. Uh, more often than not, minus V would mean verbose, but in grep it doesn't. Minus V means invert. So normally, grep will output all of the lines that match uh, whatever expression you put in. Minus V says output all of the lines that don't match. Okay, so lines beginning with zero or more white spaces. That just means that we're ignoring all of the indentation. Okay, then lines that begin with a hash followed by any number of whatever character random characters okay up to uh, oh um, this query uh, yeah this is <laughs> okay the query means zero or one of these occurrences okay so what this expression is going to match oh the dollar means the end of line so what this is matching goes is a line so from the beginning of the line to the end of the line okay it will match anything which contains zero or more white space characters and zero or more occurrences of a current character followed by anything the upshot of this is that this expression will match any line which is empty in other words contains nothing contains any white space characters tabs spaces and the like uh, and contains zero or one comment on the line why zero because i want to get rid of blank lines as well okay so, I want to get rid of blank lines and comment lines, and that's exactly what this expression will do, okay? Because it matches blank or comment lines, the minus V says output anything which doesn't match this, so basically all the other lines, and output those into the vagrant file. Uh, right. The problem is, if you do that, okay, well, let's do it, okay, now, and there, uh, there is our completely blank vagrant file, and why is that? It's because uh, let me just uh, it's because uh, we are effectively outputting it straight into. Uh, hang on a minute. Let's recreate it. Okay. Uh, if we oops, if we do that without redirecting it okay so this is what we're expecting but we we're getting an empty file why is that well it's because the cat is feeding those lines one at a time but as soon as it encounters the first time it wants to output something uh, the vagrant file is being held open so we end up with an empty file because we output nothing to that vagrant file which is then being read so we effectively immediately truncate the file and the cat will stop okay so in order to do this we would have to do it in two steps huh? vagrant file one oops like that okay so now um, if i vi vagrant file one okay we get what we expected Okay, but of course we've still got the vagrant file, so that's kind of sucky. Okay, so let's get rid of that and try it a different way. Okay, so we've still got 
we've still got our original vacant fault okay so now we'll try the second way okay now we can try it with orc okay this allows us to do it in uh, again uh, two steps and the reason is because for the same reason okay uh, strictly speaking we don't need that pipe we can just do it like that with, with and okay so this time we're running the same thing okay the orc match is exactly the same so the regular expression is the same as it was before okay but this time instead of minus v to invert it we're putting the not in front so this says to orc any line that does not match this pattern print that line out right. and we run it over the original vagrant file we output it to this intermediate file v.temp then we immediately move v.temp to vagrant file right so we're effectively doing exactly the same thing as we would have done with the cat right. so do that and now provide the vagrant file Oops. and there it is our truncated file okay with the only three lines that actually matter uh, right, uh, let's get rid of that okay so both of those solutions end up with an intermediate file uh, orc arguably is slightly better because you're only running the orc program whereas with this you're running the cat program and the grep file uh, and the grep program and still having to do the file renaming anyway so yeah. there's a slightly better solution uh, let's recreate the, the long form again okay so there's our commented file and this time we can do it with said which is the stream editor now the advantage of said is that this i means edit in place okay so this is saying <coughs> um, it's slightly more complicated okay so this is saying and this is the expression which is going to be evalu evaluated so this is the said expression which is going to be evaluated okay so said it says if you find any line that matches this pattern which is any number of spaces followed by effectively a comment okay then delete it then if that resulting line okay whether this has been run or not really okay if that consists of nothing but a blank line or a line of spaces then delete that okay now we need to we need to do it in two steps because there's no easy way uh, for us to uh, uh, delete a line uh, there's no easy way to do the or effectively that we need to do right? so uh, this gets around that problem by basically saying because there's no there's no like conditional grouping and stuff like that uh, so we just have to match the two cases the first case which is where we've got a comment somewhere on a line maybe preceded by spaces and the second one is where we've got a line which consists of nothing but zero or more spaces right and again we only have to do this once because we've got the vagrant bar so do that and now we can do a vagrant file and there it is okay exactly what we wanted okay so we've minimized our file now arguably we really want to leave the first two lines in uh, now in order to do that we could just skip the first two lines or we can put them back in because they're just these two lines here one which says uh, one which is uh, Emacs, which says it's uh, a, a Ruby, and the other one which is a Vi, which says it's a Ruby file. Okay, uh, we can just take those two, and then 
find an anchor file and paste them back in. Oops. There we go. Okay, so now when we open it up, we got all nice colours. Right. Okay. <sighs> right. Uh, the other way we could do it is we could just type these three lines in. <laughs> okay, which has the same net effect. So let's take a look at this. Uh, this is, as these two lines suggest, okay, a vagrant file is basically just a Ruby file. So anything you do in Ruby, you can do in a vagrant file. All right. um, vagrant provides effectively a library of facilities that will help you in creating your virtual machine. So let's take a look at these three lines, okay? These two lines, the fur, uh, lines, line four and line six, okay, uh, are always going to be required. They're effectively defining the uh, vagrant uh, configuration. Uh, this is the version number. Uh, so the style of configuration at the moment it's always version 2 right? uh, and has been for a long time uh, maybe one day we'll get version 3 but at the moment there doesn't seem to be a need to change so version 2 uh, and it's this config variable that we're actually going to back uh, setting okay and within that uh, we've got uh, vm within that box which we're defining as being bento debian 10 which is the base box we want to uh, create okay so that is the absolute bare minimum basically for a vagrant file if we now run vagrant up this will take a wee while Oh, actually, before I do that, before I do that, it's worth mentioning that I also have installed some plugins. Uh, and it's plugin. I probably have to say list as well. Mm, yeah. Uh, and this is what I mean by forgetting stuff. I mean, it's been so long since I did anything with these plugins other than update them that I forget. Okay, um, I have some plugins, and it's worth installing them if you don't, or at least one of them. Uh, the one that's really worth having universally is this one, Vagrant VB Guest. When you uh, run up a virtual box, uh, you'll find that, for example, you don't get... Uh, some of the extended facilities uh, like the availability of USB 3 drivers and stuff like that no, not drivers um, um, uh, <sighs> controllers um, so the VB guest uh, just makes sure that your VirtualBox has got the VirtualBox guest additions installed uh, and that they're up to date, or, or more to the point, it will notify you if they're not up to date, and you can then go about updating them. Okay, uh, so it's worth having this Vagrant VB Guest edition. I also have Vagrant Reload, which is no longer really necessary, so you probably don't need that. And I have Vagrant SCP, which is um, the secure copy, which really is a nice to have uh, when you're mucking about setting these things up the first time. Uh, because invariably you will forget to transfer something up to the machine uh, or you need something temporarily uh, for a test or something like that and it's just nice and easy you can go to the command line you can configure an SCP it means you don't have to muck about looking up what the true IP address and stuff like that and which port is running on all that nonsense you just do a vagrant SCP and you can secure a copy between your host and the virtual machine uh, without messing about. So, uh, to install these, okay, all you do is you do vagrant install and then whichever one you want, uh, you know, uh, vagrant VB guest or whatever. Yeah? Uh, 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 and I will install them. In fact, it's probably. Uh, 
uh, it's probably listed. Here we go, plugins. Uh, uh, does it actually list the standard ones? Um, Doesn't seem to have them. Um, doesn't seem it doesn't seem to have, uh, it doesn't seem to have listed any standard ones, but. Um, yeah, just do uh, uh, maybe guest plugin. There we go. There you go. So, for what it's worth, I would recommend always having this installed. Uh, um, you'll see it in action in a second because we're going to do vagrant up, and this will this will now uh, create the vagrant machine. Uh, so you can see uh, if this is the first time you've run it, it will go through the rather long process of downloading the virtual box. Uh, it's already downloaded on my machine. Uh, you can see it's already checked to see if there's a new version of the the actual box so this is not the bb guest this is just the the, the box uh, and it said yes there is one but we can ignore that for now it rather nicely tells you that you run vagrant box update to get the latest version this is because uh, the, the bento systems obviously rebuilt the debian 10 box Right now, all this witchcraft down here uh, is is telling you uh, that uh, this is one of the things that Vagrant takes care of for you. Because uh, a Vagrant guest always has to have SSH running, because that's the way Vagrant interacts with it. Okay. Oops. Uh, if I... Okay. So it always has to have Vagrant uh, SSH running. Okay, and what it does is it makes sure that it's assigned to a free port on your host machine. In this case, it's telling me that it's attempted to map 22, which is the standard SSH port, onto 2200 on the host. Okay, and because that's already occupied, sorry, to 2022 on the host, because that's already occupied, it's changed it to 2200. So you don't really need to know any of that normally uh, unless you want to use a uh, standard SSH client uh, okay uh, this is the bit you it is interesting the guest editions yeah so this is now uh, trying to reconcile this because uh, it's saying that the guest editions on the host which is the one I've got installed on my virtual box is 6110 and the guest has only got 618. Generally speaking, that's not going to be a problem. But uh, it's now installing 6110. Uh, sorry, uh, it's now saying, okay, I'm now going to attempt to upgrade the virtual box guest editions. So it's trying to reconcile a guest version with the guest uh, with the one on my host like i said if, if you're out by a sort of uh, patch version so as long as the 6.1 matches you're probably okay uh, but again this is the great thing about the vb guest uh, plugin it deals with all this nonsense for you
Uh, right. Uh, so now we're, we're all set up. Now you'll notice uh, uh, we don't need that. Uh, that, that, that default uh, won't normally exist. However, you'll notice that we've now got this dot vagrant directory. And in there, we've got all sorts of stuff. And the most important part of which is this one, okay, which is the actual virtual machine that we are running. <coughs> uh, uh, we'll come back to some of this, like the private key and what that means. But um, uh, for now, just know that that dot vagrant directory uh, exists and it's where your virtual machine lives. Uh, okay, so now if we do vagrant ssh, it will go to the default machine, which is uh, the one we just created. Okay, now when you run vagrant ssh, you must be in the directory with the vagrant file in order that it can find it. Right? Uh, otherwise, you'll get an error, uh, or you'll be sshing into a different <laughs> a different virtual machine okay so now we're on uh, effectively on a an installed Debian machine nice okay so uh, you'll notice that we're on as uh, vagrant mm. okay so we've got the vagrant user we're on as vagrant uh, uh, we can however sudo and become root. You can't log into root on these uh, on these boxes, but that's that's okay because nobody wants to. Uh, we can just sudo when we need to. Okay. Uh, so we've got full control over the box, and we can do pretty much what we like. Okay. Uh, to get rid of it, I can do. Uh, well, I can I can do I can do interesting things. I, I can I can halt it. I can, uh, which is like um, a power off. Yeah, I can do a reload, which is effectively a reboot, which will shut the machine down and restart it. Um, there are various other commands, uh, like for example, you can take snapshots. Okay, so you can take a snapshot, uh, which means you can save and restore a snapshot, which can be really useful when you're doing something. So, so. You can you can take a snapshot, then you can do an experiment with your virtual machine. Decide that that was a really bad idea, and restore the snapshot just as you can with your virtual machine normally. Okay. Uh, oh, there you go. Looks like they've added SCP as a standard vagrant command, so you don't need the. Uh, uh, that might be added by the add-on actually by the plugin. Mm, ignore me. That, that could very well be there for because that, yeah. Ignore me, I'm just rambling because uh, VB guest is also plugging. Uh, right, the uh, SSH config is useful if you want to use your own uh, SSH client. So if you're using something like um, Putty, okay, if you do this. Okay, this will tell you all the details you need in order to be able to actually just SSH in. Yeah? So you can do things like um, uh, connect to the host uh, at that port. Uh, you'll need this identity file, okay, which is the which allows you to log in. Uh, you can actually use the SSH config file directly uh, if you. Uh, it's the same format as the standard. SSH.config. Uh, in actual fact, it says that up here. Look, and it outputs the valid configuration to connect to the machine. There you go. Well, uh, and in fact, it will also, if you've got a multi machine setup, it will output all of the machines so that you can actually uh, connect them. We're not going to bother with any of that for now. We're just going to use Vagrant because once you're in the virtual machine, uh, we're, we're going to be happy. Um, what else? Mm. Mm. 
Um, yeah, we're going to look at provisioning at some length in the next session, I suspect. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, Vagrant uh, validates useful. If you made a lot of modifications to your Vagrant file, uh, rather than running it and discovering it doesn't work, uh, you can do this. Uh, and that will just tell you whether or not your Vagrant file is crap or whether it works. Uh, that doesn't mean, of course, it will do the right thing. It just means that it won't bomb out. Right. Now, that can be useful, particularly in, in a pipeline that uses Vagrant, if you're into that kind of thing. Right, uh, yeah, the other one we're going to want is Vagrant Destroy. Uh, we're going to be making and destroying machines on a regular basis, so uh, you need to know that one. Uh, if I do Vagrant Destroy now, it will destroy any Vagrant machine specified by this Vagrant file. We'll look later at destroying individual machines. Um, if I do it like this, it will prompt me just to be sure that I want to get rid of the machine. And if it's in a multi-machine setup, it will do it for each machine. It'll prompt me, are you sure you want to destroy this machine? Are you sure you want to destroy this machine? And so on. Uh, which can get tiresome. Uh, so there's a vagrant destroy flag uh, minus F, which is a force. That will destroy every, every virtual machine created by that vagrant file without prompting. Uh, so use with caution because you can shoot yourself in the foot as with any of these forces right okay so uh, right so then we're going to start uh, actually bootstrapping uh, Oh mm. uh, yeah, yeah, I was going to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, okay. When you do a vagrant SSH, uh, uh, like for example, uh, okay, I'll, I'll got rid of it now. Uh, yeah, what the hell? We'll recreate it. Okay, having having just destroyed the machine, let's go vagrant up and just rebuild it. Uh, Right, uh, we're going to talk uh, in the next session about uh, provisioning a vagrant machine, which is really where they start getting useful. Okay, because we're, we, we, you know, um, provisioning is when you tailor the machine to the specific requirements uh, of your project. Now, it's very common within the provisioning to uh, start out by uh, doing an update and an upgrade. Now, update uh, will, uh, uh, of course, that's complete nonsense actually, because it's not sudo up, it's sudo at get. Mm -hmm. um, Uh, yeah, um, it's it's very common within a vagrant files provisioning to see people do an update and an upgrade. Uh, now, what that will do is just as with doing them on a normal Linux box, is it will uh, or Debian box anyway, uh, it will do the update of all of the uh, catalog. Uh, of packages and then it will do an upgrade on the machine to make sure that all the packages that are installed on the machine are at the latest versions which is very cool but you should consider carefully particularly when you're uh, providing the vagrant file for use by developers for example uh, whether that's what you really want to do uh, you, you, it can be very easy to have developers uh, ending up with virtual machines with packages on different level, uh, different versions, uh, and yeah. So, for example, if developer one comes on day one of the project, uh, builds his virtual machine, then uses that for months, which is 
quite conceivable. Uh, if he doesn't do regular updates and upgrades, uh, then all of the packages on the machine will be from day one. Uh, developer 2 comes along uh, and builds his virtual machine on month 3, for example. And if there's been some significant updates to the packages, uh, the first thing his Vagrant file will do in the provisioning is do an update and an upgrade. So his packages will all be three months newer than the first developer. Uh, now, okay, that may not make any difference, but it, it could. And you could end up with some very subtle differences in your developer base. If, however, you rely on the core Vagrant box uh, to provide your baseline, um, then that problem is mitigated somewhat because when Vagrant is built, as long as you don't do an update and an upgrade, those packages are effectively frozen to whatever they were when the box was uh, first built. Uh, in other words, it, it forms the baseline. So as long as your developers don't do an update and an upgrade, they know it's consistent. Now, you might say, yeah, but developers are going to do an update <clears throat> and they're going to do an upgrade. Okay, fine. But the point is they can get back to a known state by destroying their box and doing a vagrant up again. Okay, and that known state will be whatever the box was when it was delivered. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so when you're in a, uh, a, a a project environment, that may be a more useful way of doing it. The, the box becomes the baseline and not uh, you, you don't let people do their own updates and upgrades. Or more the point, you don't do the update and upgrade as part of the official image so that when somebody needs to recreate the box, they can get back to that known state. Uh, It's just just for shits and giggles. Let's see how many. So this is a reasonably up to date box, but you can see there are eight packages that will be upgraded. Uh, in this case, uh, it's the Linux edit. So if I was using this virtual machine for doing. <coughs> Um, uh, kernel development, then this would almost certainly have some kind of impact. Uh, similarly, if I was using uh, the C compiler, uh, it might make a difference between. Well, um, oh, it's a very minor build update, but it it it, it could make a difference. That's the point. Mm -hmm. And this is only a matter of uh, uh, a very short period. <clears throat> uh, so yes, the, the long and the short is uh, think long and hard about whether you want the update and upgrade to be part of your vagrant provisioning rather than part of the build of the base box, okay, which again We'll cover later. Uh, we'll do with a with a packer. Uh, uh, configuration. <clears throat> okay, uh, that's all I wanted to show you. Really, was the impact of doing this stuff. Right. Uh, it also shows you how easy it is to destroy and recreate these machines. Uh, Oh, here we go. I can do destroy minus F, can't I? Uh, okay, so now it won't it won't prompt me. It will just kill that virtual box. Uh, virtual machine. There you go. Now the point being that the vagrant file is still there, and in actual fact. So is the vagrant file. All, all we've done is notionally destroy it. Uh, it, it, it won't be available to SSH into. Uh, uh, we can't reload or anything like that. Uh, the only thing we can do is vagrant up, which will rebuild the box from 
our vacant file definition. <clears throat> okay, cool. Uh, I think I'm going to call that it. Mm -hmm. You want your dinner now, won't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's dinner time. And I'm starting to get hoarse. Right, uh, that was inc incredibly quick and not. Yeah, the, the, these are really just going back over ground that I've already started the notes for um, the formal lessons. Uh, I've already recorded video for these as well. It's just a question of recording uh, the scripts. Uh, so this is kind of a catch up stream. Ordinarily, uh, you will see me tearing my hair out, banging my head up against the desk and trying to figure out actual real technical problems. Um, uh, and in fact, tomorrow, no, well, Wednesday's the next schedule screen. I, I might do one tomorrow. Uh, we'll start looking at Bootstrap uh, and how we can start defining the provisioning of our Vagrant Box uh, in a controlled way. Stick that into Git, you'll be able to access those. Uh, so you can build a box very much the same as mine. Uh, ultimately, uh, we will uh, build up so that you can, from scratch or from whichever point you join the course, uh, you'll be able to build your version of our development environment. Why am I air quoting that? Uh, of your development environment so that you can join the network of people uh, following along. Right, uh, I'm going to call on it. <clears throat>